Welcome to the Tobacco Online Policy Seminar Tops. Thank you for joining us today. I'm Mahmoud Al Alwan, a tobacco researcher at The Ohio State University. Tops is organized by C. Shang from The Ohio State University, Justin White from University of California, San Francisco, Mike Pesco from Georgia State University, and Catherine McLean from George, George Mason University. The seminar will be one hour with questions from the moderator and discussant. The audience may pose questions and comments in the Q&A <coughs> panel, and the moderator will draw from these questions and comments in conversation with the presenter. Please review the guidelines on tobaccopolicy.org for acceptable comments. Please keep the comments professional and related to the research being discussed. Comments that meet the seminar series guidelines will be shared with the presenter afterwards, even if they are not read aloud. Your comments are very much appreciated. This presentation is being video recorded and will be made available, along with presentation slides on the TOPS website, tobaccopolicy.org. I will turn the presentation over to today's moderator, Si Shang from The Ohio State University, to introduce our speaker. Today, we conclude our spring 2022 season with a single paper presentation by Davo Dave entitled, Have Recreational Marijuana Laws Undermined Progress on Adult Tobacco Use? This presentation was selected <coughs> for a competitive review process by submission through the TOPS website. Davo Dave is Stanton Research Professor of Economics at Bentley University research associate at the National Bureau of Economic Research and a research fellow at the Institute of Labor Economics. His research focuses on the analysis of public policy and on the economics of behavioral health and human capital. Some of his current work is studying the market for electronic cigarettes, prescription drug abuse, intergenerational effects of welfare policies, COVID-19 related interventions and disparities and marijuana policies. His research has been supported by the NIH, AHRQ, and various foundations, has been published in leading academic journals, and has been cited in congressional testimony, White House reports, and various popular media. Dr. Dave received his PhD from the Graduate Center of the City University of New York, followed by a postdoctoral research fellowship at the Wharton School of the University of Pennsylvania. Our discussion today is Dr. Dan Sachs from the Wisconsin School of Business. Dr. Michael Pascal from Georgia State University is a co-author of the study and will answer still at Q&As. Dr. Dave, thank you for presenting for us today. Great, thank you so much, C. Um, let me just share my slides. Great. Um, hi, everyone. Thank you so much for having me. So um, it's a pleasure to be here and presenting this work in front of everyone. Um, so what I want to talk about today is how... Sorry, oh. don't for interrupting. We are now seeing um, now the, uh, the, the, the next slide as well. So I think you need to change the mode. I see. Okay, hold on one sec. So see, did you say you're seeing the um, two slides in a row? Uh, yeah, so it's, uh, I think it, there is a presenting mode that shows. I see, I see. Okay, okay, thank you. Oh, it's perfect. Thank you. Is that perfect? Okay, thank you. Sorry about that. Um, so, again, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, I should mention this is part of um, a larger project that we're working on. So, any comments, any questions that you have will be greatly appreciated. And again, feel free to sort of email any of us even after the talk. Um, speaking of which, um, I'm very, very fortunate to have a stellar team of co-authors. Um, Yang Liang, Mike Pesco is here. Thanks, Mike, for manning the chat. Uh, Serena Phillips and Joe Sabia. Um, and this is all alphabetical, so it's very much a joint team effort. So, quick. Sorry about that. So quick acknowledgements and disclosures. Um, no one on the team has any conflicts of interest for this research to, um, to disclose. So in terms of a quick outline of what I want to talk about today, I want to start with some context in terms of how we're thinking about recreational marijuana legalization, these broad legalization efforts that have been underway in many states. 
Um, and you know, before diving into what our specific research questions are and how they fit into this broader context, um, and then move on to our data and our research methods, our quasi-experimental research design, um, that would be a good time at that point to also take a break for any comments and questions from the audience. Again, thanks C for moderating and Dan for discussing. Um, in the paper, we have many results across different data sets, um, but today, um, given the time constraints, I will try to give you an overview of our main findings and our main patterns of results, and then briefly conclude with some implications for public health. So um, recreational marijuana laws, um, again, they have been proliferating um, across many states over the past decade. Um, these legalize the possession, use, and, and, and sale of marijuana for recreational purposes. Now, in contrast to the prior laws, the, the, medic, the medical marijuana laws, um, these are much more expansive. Um, they apply to all adults over the age of 21 in those states that have legalized. Um, and they don't just apply to medical patients. They don't require um, a prescription from the physician. They don't require the patient to be registered with the state. So these are very, very broad legalization efforts that applies to all adults over the age of 21. In most of these legalizing states, the consumer typically gains access to marijuana at the retail level um, through, through dispensaries. There is a bit of a lag between when legalization is typically enacted and when retail access actually opens up. I'll talk a little bit more about that. But typically, consumers are now able to access marijuana at the retail level for the first time. And then in most of these states, consumers are also allowed to grow marijuana themselves for their own personal consumption. So this is what the current landscape of legalization looks like in the US right now. And um, the, the states that have been shaded in darker, um, darker gray or darker black, um, these are the ones that have adopted these policies more recently. And by the way, I should add Rhode Island to this map. Um, Rhode Island recently legalized marijuana at the end of May. Um, so of course, Colorado and Washington were the first states to legalize marijuana back in um, 2012. And then since then, if we count Rhode Island, 19 states and Washington, D.C. have followed suit. And then there is a lot of growing public support for marijuana legalization. Currently, the Gallup polls so something like 68, 70 percent of the public supports legalization. And so coinciding with this growing support for legalization, um, efforts are underway in many other states as well. And also at the federal level, the MORE Act, um, which seeks to sort of decriminalize marijuana and remove marijuana from the list of controlled substances, has recently passed the House. Um, prospects are not very optimistic in the Senate, but, but these efforts are underway both at the state and the federal level. Okay. So um, the way we want to think about these broad sort of recreational marijuana legalization policies is that they represent both a demand shock and a supply shock. There is the demand shock, of course, because um, there is no longer the risk for adult consumers of being arrested, and it completely eliminates all penalties, the risk of prosecution, and so there is going to be this reduction in the full price of marijuana for the consumer before and after legalization. Consumers are also now able to access marijuana at the retail level for the first time with less uncertainty and potentially a higher grade product. There is also a supply shock, of course, right, because there is now greater competition in the marijuana market, specifically as the legal suppliers and the legal supply distribution network starts to sort of displace a lot of the underground market. Now, the social rationale for whether we should be thinking about legalizing marijuana use and sale or criminalizing it depends on a, an, on a careful accounting of what the societal costs and benefits are. Um, so many proponents of marijuana legalization, they make several points, right? First, they point out that, look, if you're using marijuana um, moderately in low doses, then this generates few adverse health consequences, um, though there are some qualifications here. There is also the point that is typically made that by liberalizing marijuana access for a broad segment of the population, this could induce some consumers to substitute away from more dangerous substances like problem drinking or opioids towards marijuana, and so may lead to some sort of a harm reduction in the process. 
by prohibiting marijuana, we are also sort of imposing considerable costs through the criminal justice system, both directly and indirectly, right? Um, the U.S. is well known for prosecuting and processing a lot of low-level drug offenders through the criminal justice system. This imposes considerable labor market penalties for these offenders upon release, and it may end up perpetuating the criminogenic cycle of disadvantage. And so maybe by legalizing marijuana, you're also leading to a lot of cost savings through the criminal justice system. And of course, the way that these drug laws also tend to be enforced in the US, there's a lot of disparities. And so proponents also make the point that look, by, by, by getting rid of marijuana prohibition, this may also help redress some of those racial disparities in the criminal justice system. Now, on the flip side of all of this, um, you know, there are also certain things that we want to be concerned about. So opponents um, bring up several points. Um, you know, first they note that, look, if legalization is shifting the consumption of marijuana towards the right tail of the distribution, then we do want to be concerned. This may have strong adverse health consequences, mental health effects, for instance, or impaired driving. There are also adverse developmental effects for adolescents that we want to be concerned about. There is also the concern that by liberalizing marijuana access for broad segments of the population, this could be a gateway towards other harder substances and may actually end up exacerbating and, and, and worsening the, the addiction crisis in the US. There could also be other spillovers into the market, both in terms of the supply side and on crime. And then a common sort of concern that is sometimes raised is that by legalizing marijuana, this may actually end up renormalizing smoking and it may actually end up increasing tobacco use. This is a legitimate, plausible concern. Um, Co-use of marijuana and tobacco has been increasing in the US, at least for some segments of the population. At least for people who vape marijuana or smoke marijuana, there is this co-administration route, which could lead to complementary effects between marijuana and tobacco. And so there are a lot of reasons to be concerned that maybe by legalizing marijuana, we may be sort of renormalizing tobacco use, renormalizing smoking in particular, and that this may undermine a lot of the progress that we have achieved in the tobacco control space. <clears throat> Okay. So the broader question um, as an economist and, 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 and you know, that, that we want to sort of frame, of course, is, is does legalizing marijuana enhance social welfare, right? That's the broad significance of what we're trying to achieve, you know, with respect to sort of adding some of these components to that question. Now, of course, as I noted, that depends on what the costs and the benefits are. So from the benefits side, you know, if we were to legalize marijuana more broadly, right, um, you know, two main benefits that most people would probably agree on is that there are going to be strong utility gains from consumers, right? If you're consuming marijuana, if this is increasing marijuana consumption, we need to bring the utility gains as one of the benefits into the picture. And then, of course, the other big sort of um, benefit, the other big cost savings that could materialize is the direct and indirect cost savings to the criminal justice system. Now, these need to be weighed against what are the potential costs of legalization. And, and this is, there's a lot of uncertainty here. This is still a lot of questions here that remains to be answered. But most people would basically be concerned about the fact that legalizing marijuana may have these spillover effects into other markets, specifically into other harder substances. There could also be spillovers into these other drug markets on the supply side, and that may lead to complementary increases of worsening in terms of violence and criminal activity. And then as I noted, the concern that there may be spillovers into tobacco use behaviors. So here the concern is that even if marijuana legalization leads to a small increase in tobacco use, let's say it leads to a one percentage point increase in smoking, for instance, right? You know, given the huge cost of smoking, you know, this could lead to maybe something like 4,000 additional deaths from smoking every year from legalization if there's a one percentage point increase. And that could easily outweigh or maybe offset a lot of the benefits of marijuana legalization. So we want to keep our eyes on what's going on in terms of the tobacco markets as well. And so we are not answering the broader question is legalization societally 
beneficial or not, we are adding in this paper, at least, you know, a key component of this cost benefit calculus in terms of how marijuana legalization is impacting tobacco use behaviors. And so that's a research question in this paper. You know, what are the spillovers of broadly legalizing marijuana on tobacco use behaviors? Um, I should mention that in this particular paper, our focus is on adults. So we have other work that we've started, but we're specifically looking at youth. But everything that I'm going to present today is going to be focused on adults. Um, and we are presenting a few sort of different types of evidence in the process of sort of answering this question. You know, first, we are going to talk about what are the effects of marijuana legalization on marijuana use itself, right? This is important. It's not new, but it is important because it helps us sort of understand what is the size of the underlying population that is being impacted by legalization. So if legalization is impacting and increasing marijuana use, that's the population among which we would expect there to be spillover effects in terms of other substances if they exist, right? So this sort of helps us bound what are the biggest impacts we would potentially expect and sort of also bound the plausibility of our magnitudes. And then we go on to our main question in terms of what are the spillovers into uh, tobacco use behaviors and across multiple data sets we're able to observe this both for combustible tobacco as well as different types of tobacco. We will also sort of look at different margins of use, intensive margins, extensive margins, and, and initiation cessation. And then in this paper, we're also particularly paying careful attention to dynamics in two ways. You know, one, you know, are the policy effects static over time or do they change? Do they get weaker over time? Do they magnify over time? And there are very strong reasons to expect that there would be dynamic effects over time with respect to some of these policies and how they're playing out. And then second, we also sort of pay careful attention to dynamics in terms of transitions across different margins of use. So for instance, does marijuana legalization impact the probability that a person or respondent was previously not using any of these substances is now going to start initiating these substances? Or does marijuana legalization impact the probability of transitioning into dual use? Or does marijuana legalization impact the probability that a user is now going to increase or decrease their probability of cessation? So by looking at these dynamic transitions across different states of consumption, we're able to sort of ascertain where the effects are coming from if they are present. Right. So um, in terms of time constraints, I'll make a few points about prior literature. Um, so there are four strains of literature that are differentially relevant for us. You know, there's a lot of studies, of course, that have looked at the relationship between tobacco use and marijuana use um, in a correlational sense, in a descriptive sense. These are nice in the sense that they tell us that, look, there is a relationship there potentially and that we need to look at this further. So most of this correlational work has basically found that, yes, tobacco use and marijuana use does co-occur and that use of one substance um, subsequently predicts the use of the other. And then there's a second sort of set of studies that are relevant for us. Um, so there is a good set of studies that have basically exploited natural experiments, quasi-experimental variation to sort of look at what is the relationship between tobacco use and marijuana use. Specifically, there's a set of studies that have used tobacco control policies to drive exogenous variation in tobacco use and then seeing what type of spillovers this would have on marijuana use. And so most of these studies either find no relationship or a complementary relationship. So for instance, tobacco control policies that end up reducing tobacco use either have no impacts on marijuana use or they also end up reducing marijuana use. So one quick point about these studies that have used sort of this policy variation on the tobacco control side. Um, one thing to note is that cross policy effects, cross price effects don't need to be symmetric. Unless we impose specific restrictions on the utility function, there is no restriction that these cross policy effects need to be symmetric. So what that means is that just because tobacco control policies tend to find that there are no effects on marijuana use or there are complementary effects on marijuana use does not necessarily mean that marijuana policies would also have a complementary relationship with tobacco. There is no reason to expect that symmetry. And so we move on to other studies that are more relevant 
in the sense that they have specifically looked at marijuana policies. So here there is some work that has looked at medical marijuana laws, the predecessors to these broad legalization efforts. You know, some of this work has been done by members of our own team. And, you know, these studies tend to find that medical marijuana laws end up either having no effect on tobacco use or they end up reducing tobacco use. So in our case, our paper, our previous paper in the American Journal of Health Economics found that medical marijuana laws end up having a very small negative effect on tobacco use. So they reduce cigarette consumption by a small amount. Um, two points about these studies that have looked at medical marijuana laws. Um, again, very relevant in the sense that they are linking um, marijuana policy to tobacco use. But the effects of medical marijuana laws may not necessarily generalize to these broad legalization efforts for a couple of reasons. You know, one, um, the medical marijuana laws, by definition, were targeting a very small pool of the population. So these are people, these are medical patients. They typically required a recommendation from the physician. They had to be registered with the state. And so that means that the marginal medical patient who is impacted by these medical marijuana laws is going to be very different than the marginal consumer who is now being impacted when you broadly legalize marijuana for all sort of adults. Um, and so there's not going to be a strong case here that these effects that we find for the medical marijuana policies may necessarily generalize to the broader legaliz legalization efforts. And the second point that is important to make here is that every state that has legalized marijuana for recreational purposes already had a medical policy in place. So what that means is that the treatment effect or the policy effect that we are identifying is what is the incremental effect of liberalizing marijuana access for everybody, all adults, on top of having already expanded access for medical patients. So it's an incremental effect. And so that's the margin that we're going to be identifying our effects off of. And then more recently, there has been a small handful of studies that have started to look at recreational marijuana policies. This is a very nice start to the literature, but this work has been limited in several respects. They, they either look at only one or two states, or they look at a very specific population, or they've only looked at aggregate cigarette sales. And so a lot of questions remains unanswered um, in this literature. Okay. Yeah. So that brings us to the data. So we actually use four national data sets um, for this question. So first, we start with the National Survey of Drug Use and Health and this the data. So across all of our data sets, um, we typically have time periods that span up to 20 years. So from the NISDA data, um, we use the state year aggregated sort of information on, on all of these different sort of measures of marijuana use and tobacco use. So one of the nice advantages of the NISDA data is that the, it has the long time period over which we can sort of identify all of these changes in policies. And then second, um, the NISDA data is one of the few data sets that has information both on marijuana use as well as tobacco use for the same sample. So after the NISDA data, we then sort of move on to the micro level, individual level data sets. So when we use the behavioral risk factor surveillance system, the BRFAS data spanning 20 years, the big advantage of the BRFAS is, of course, the big sample size that allows us to sort of look at heterogeneous effects across different subpopulations. And then the BRFAS data also includes information on electronic cigarette use starting in 2016. So we're able to sort of look at that in addition to cigarette smoking. And then we move on to the current population surveys, the tobacco use supplements. Um, a disadvantage of the TUS is that it's not always annual, that there is a staggering of when the waves were um, administered by NCI. But a big advantage of the CPS TUS, again, it has a big sample size. And then this is also giving us very detailed information on different types of tobacco use. So we're able to observe not just cigarettes, but sort of non-combustible tobacco products in addition to electronic cigarettes as well. And then also good measures of different margins of tobacco use, intensive and extensive margins. And then finally, we move on to the PAT data, the population assessment of tobacco and health. Um, a disadvantage, of course, here is that it has a smaller time period, it started in 2013, but the big advantage of the PAT data is that it's longitudinal, so it allows us to push our analysis further in a couple of directions and answer questions that cannot be answered with cross-sectional data. And then second, with the PAT data, we also have really, really good information on different types of tobacco use, co-use of marijuana and tobacco, electronic cigarette use, um, and so a lot of sort of um, strengths that the PAT data is able to sort of check off that the other data data sets don't have.
So um, in terms of our research design, um, we're, we're sort of exploiting the variation in how these policies are being enacted across different states, across different time periods. And of course, you also have a lot of states that have not adopted these marijuana um, legalization policies. And so this natural experiment translates very nicely into this sort of generalized difference in difference two-way fixed effects model. So let me just sort of take you to the baseline model and then the extensions that we make to this model to sort of address specific issues. So our outcome um, represents either of our marijuana use outcomes or our tobacco use outcomes at the state and the year level for the NISDA data and at the individual level for all of the other data sets. And then we also control for all of the major policy indicators related to marijuana, recreational marijuana policies, medicinal marijuana policies. We have a very, very rich set of controls um, for other sociodemographics, um, economic policies, substance abuse policies, welfare, welfare policies, opioid policies, and so on. Um, and then the requisite fixed effects for the time period. Again, this is going to control for any general secular changes and trends over our sample period state fixed effects to account for any stable time invariant heterogeneity across different states. In the paper, we also present models with and without state-specific linear trends, um, just to account for the possibility that there may be something unobserved going on at the state level that is changing over time, though for several reasons you want to sort of take those results with a grain of salt, because it may also sort of end up washing away some of the dynamics. But in the paper, we present models both with and without the state linear trends. And then our standard errors are adjusted for, um, for any correlation within states over time. So this is our baseline model. This is our baseline framework. And then we extend this framework in several ways to address specific issues. So first, um, excuse me. So first, in most states, um, there was typically a lag um, anywhere from a few months to a year and a half between when legalization was enacted and when licenses were actually distributed and retail access opened up and dispensaries started opening. So in some of our analysis, we separate out the effects of legalization per se versus when consumers actually had retail access to marijuana through dispensaries. Um, for all of our outcomes, we also present event study analysis for a couple of reasons. You know, one, it allows us to sort of um, gauge the quality of our natural experiment, to gauge how parallel the trends are between the control groups and the treatment groups. And then it also allows us to very nicely visualize what the policy dynamics are. Are the effects getting stronger over time? Are they static over time? And we'll talk about more of that when we go to the results. Um, for some of our early adopting states, we also estimate synthetic control difference and differences models for a couple of reasons, just to see if there's any heterogeneity across different states. But more importantly, um, this allows us to sort of observe a longer post policy window. So for instance, if you look at Colorado and Washington, they were the earliest adopting states. For these states, we have seven years of post policy data. So we can observe what the effects are over a longer period of time, just to make sure that the short term effects are not disappearing once you sort of open up the policy window. Okay. We're also mindful of the recent literature um, on two-way fixed effects, diff and diff models, um, you know, that has brought to light that, look, if you have a setting where policies are being enacted at different points in time um, and there is dynamic treatment effects heterogeneity, then maybe your standard estimates could be biased and maybe your estimates may not even be picking up the causal effect that you want because of funky weighting issues. So we also re-estimate all of our analysis using a, one of the newer estimators by by, um, the one proposed in this case by Calloway and Santana in the Journal of Econometrics paper. And then the PAT data, which is longitudinal, that allows us to sort of push these analysis further in a couple of directions, right? With the longitudinal data, we can, of course, also include individual fixed effects to account for heterogeneity across people. And then more importantly, we can also estimate discrete time hazard models with the longitudinal data. The big advantage here, or the main reason for doing this, is this allows us to sort of assess 
whether legalization is impacting the probability of transitioning across different margins of use. Does legalization impact the probability that a consumer who was previously an abstainer is now going to start using one substance or both substances? So does legalization impact the probability that a consumer who was previously using one or both substances is now going to quit or not quit? So the discrete time hazard models helps us sort of get very cleanly at what those transition probabilities are and how they have been impacted by, by marijuana legalization. Um, I think so. This will be a great sort of um, pause point um, um, for any questions or comments from Dan and the audience. That was fantastic. So let's turn to our discussion today to see whether he has any comments. Um, okay, well, I see that there were many questions uh, in the chat, but Mike seems to have answered them. Um, so I have held my questions until this moment, so Mike can't answer them. Um, so one thing that I found myself wondering about as um, I read the paper and watched the presentation is what um, prompts states to um, introduce recreational marijuana laws. And in particular, sort of, <laughs> is it um, that they see the success of the medical marijuana laws, or is it part of a kind of a broader public health um, liberalization around um, drug use? Um, so you know, what else is going on in the policy background that maybe we should be thinking about um, as we look at these uh, effects, yeah, that's a great question, Dan. Um, so you, I think I think what you mentioned is all of the above, right? So um, from an empirical standpoint, we certainly want to be very concerned about that this is not a static landscape, right? Over this time period, that states are sort of legalizing marijuana either medically or more sort of broadly for recreational purposes. A lot of other stuff has been going on, right? Um, both from the economic standpoint, right? This is happening during the 2000s, um, the medical marijuana policies, for instance, and then the legalization is happening over the last 10 years over an economy that has been changing differentially for different states. And then, of course, a lot of opioid policies have been going on at this time as well, right? You know, opioids are getting much more restrictive. And so to the extent that we think about any potential substitution between opioids and marijuana, we want to be concerned about that as well. So, um, you know, we do our best in, in at least empirically to sort of bring in all of this other policy variation that is happening. Um, E-cigarette taxes are being enacted. Tobacco control policies are getting more and more stringent, while marijuana is becoming more and more liberalized. Um, often at the same state level. And so you're right about that. In terms of conceptually, you know, where, you know, why is legalization happening? I think, as I mentioned, you know, for all of these states that have legalized marijuana, they've already sort of legalized it for medical purposes. So it's part, it's at least it seems to be part of this broader effort towards um, sort of going towards a more expansive approach. Um, and then I think if you look at people's risk perceptions in states that have sort of legal, legal not legalized, but liberalized marijuana access for medical purposes, you know, more and more individuals in those states tend to now suggest that marijuana is maybe not as risky, not as harmful. So there seems to be a changing public conception of what marijuana is, you know, once the state liberalizes it for medical access. And that may also be an impetus for policymakers to sort of consider this broader legalization. Thanks. Um, it seems like in uh, the NISDA and especially in PATH, there's very rich measures of marijuana use. And I have a couple of questions about that. So the, the first question is just, what's your sense about how well measured marijuana use is? And, and is there possibly an effect of legalization on the measurement rather than than the use. Yeah, but that's a great question. That's a great question, Dan. I, I'm not going to have a great answer for you, um, but it, it, it's it's it, it is definitely a concern, right? So the, the the I guess from an econometric standpoint, the concern is, um, you know, legalization is is of course changing prices and it's changing purity and it's changing access, but it's also changing sort of, you know, the stigma associated with marijuana use. It's changing the social environment through which people perceive marijuana. And so could legalization be impacting just the reporting of marijuana, right? You know, prior, maybe when marijuana was not legal or much more restrictive, maybe people are much more sort of conscious about not reporting it truthfully. And then maybe legalization now makes it more likely that people who were already using marijuana just now more truthful in their answers. And so, yeah, we definitely, um, there's not much we can do about it. We haven't done anything on that in here. We are basically taking the reports as as they are from the NISDA and the BRFIS. Um, One thing that we can look at, and I think that is something we do do here, is that you can look at differences across age. So you think that maybe the reporting issue is maybe a much bigger concern for older adults, you know, who grew up 
during a time period when marijuana was perceived very differently. And then legalization really has a big change in the perceptions. For younger adults, it's probably much sort of less important. And so, you know, if we see increases in marijuana use both for younger and older adults, that may be sort of, you know, some indication that something is going on here. The other thing we were thinking about this is, you know, is there a way we can actually sort of look at this reporting issue, or at least tease it out a little bit better. Um, and at least conceptually, maybe there are data sets, maybe the analyst wise one data set. We could potentially look at people's reporting of marijuana use very, very close to when legalization happens. So typically dates of interview. So you can look at respondents who were interviewed just before legalization, then respondents who were interviewed just after legalization. Their 30 day look back period is still pretty much the same. But again, that differential window over which when they're reporting, you know, if you see a big difference there, then that could be sort of some indication that maybe it is a reporting issue. We haven't done that yet, but I guess that's conceptually maybe one way which you can tease out. But you're absolutely right about that. That is something that we want to be sort of put, putting on the back burner or in the background here that, you know, there could be some reporting issues here. Yeah, that's an interesting thought around the um, sort of age and look back. I guess <clears throat> I also thought maybe... Um, between the NISDA and PATH or others, like NISDA seems especially careful about the elicitation procedure. So you might learn something from comparing sort of average use in, in a survey that's like really careful versus uh, reported use in like face-to-face -face interviews. Yeah, that's a good point. And then, um, okay, so my last question about the data is, um, you know, it's really interesting um, to think about sort of why uh, marijuana and tobacco would be literal complements versus like frequently co-used by the same people. And like, I think about this sort of in the context of, um, in my household, like peanut butter and jelly and chicken nuggets. So I have little kids, so we consume a lot of all of those things. And like peanut butter and jelly are like literal <laughs> compliments and consumption. You like to eat them together. Peanut butter and chicken nuggets are, at least for us, not compliments, but we, it looks like they go together because the same um, people who like peanut butter and jelly like chicken nuggets. So, you know, the point of this paper, of course, is to sort of separate those two stories. Um, and I am not an expert on marijuana use, but I think for the most part, like marijuana and tobacco are not physical uh, complements and consumption. You typically don't consume both at the same time, except as you point out in the context of bloods. So what that, that brings me to the question of the suggestion, which is I think just descriptive evidence on like how common is blunt use, what share of all marijuana use um, in the, the, the change in marijuana use over time is blunt use, tells us something about how big the complementary effects could be, unless we think like using marijuana today makes people more likely to wanna to use tobacco in the future which I think is a, a less obvious mechanism. I think you could learn a lot just from the descriptives. And I'd be curious to see the descriptives on sort of blunt use as a share of overall use. Yeah, that's a great point. Thanks, Dan. I, we definitely can bring more discussion on that. Um, I think we have the descriptives on blunt use in one of the future slides, which I don't have at the top of my head. But in terms of just what percent of the population, maybe from the NISDA data, co-use marijuana and tobacco at the same time in the past month, it's something like maybe between four and a half to 5%. But that's a great point. Thank to you. To clarify, that means like literally at the same moment? No, no, not literally at the same time. So if you think about, if you look at what percent of respondents report both past month marijuana yeah, use exactly. and past month tobacco use. So again, it may not be. So that's blunt, uh, peanut so, yeah. butter and chicken nuggets versus peanut exactly. butter and jelly. <laughs> right. Thank you. Um, so I see Mike is answering the questions posted on the panel, but I think there are uh, two questions related to the forms of uh, cannabis or marijuana. And uh, you know it could be used in different forms. The THC level has been increasing, right. and it, there is also a uh, participant asking about mixing cannabis with uh, two cannabis joints. So I'm just wondering, do you have any data on the forms of tobacco that be reported in the surveys? Yeah, that's a great question. See, absolutely right. So one of the things that has happened with legalization, of course, is. Um, um, there's been a shift in how people are consuming marijuana. Um, you know, right now, um, combustible smoking marijuana and vaping marijuana are still the most two common forms, but vaping is becoming more popular in terms of as a mode of delivery for marijuana and as is edibles and non-consumbustible use. And then there's also the concern that um, if you're consuming marijuana in these forms, that this may actually be even more potent um, because it's processed through the digestive system and not through the lungs. Um, and so you're absolutely right about that, right? So we do want to be sort of mindful about what those things are as well. Um, in the in the analysis that we present today, I will show some, in, um, I will show some results for vaping marijuana, but we don't then specifically also look at other sort of forms of marijuana use beyond combustible um, and beyond vaping.
but we can certainly do that in the path. I think we have good data in the path. We should definitely should add that to our to-do list. Yeah, thank you. I think it's time to continue with the presentation and uh, we'll right. save all the questions to the end. Thank you. I appreciate that. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Um, so let me take you through sort of our main sort of patterns of results. So question number one, you know, does legalizing marijuana use more broadly increase marijuana use among adults? And here the answer is a resounding yes. So robust evidence that yes, legalization does lead to an increase in marijuana use among adults. And, and these are fairly sizable effects. So we find increases in past month marijuana use on the order of about maybe three to five percentage points. So compared to the baseline, these are big effects, about 40 to 50 percent increase. Okay. Um, there are also strong dynamics here as well. So the effects start out small, about a percentage point um, you know, in the next year or two. And then over time, the effects do get larger. So there are strong dynamic effects in terms of how legalization is impacting marijuana use. This is very, very plausible for a couple of reasons. You know, one, you know, there is typically a lag between when legalization is enacted and when um retail access actually opens up in the state, typically a one-year lag for the average state. And then over time, um, marijuana prices after legalization have dropped, purity has increased, prices have stabilized, they have not dropped by as much as people might have predicted prior to legalization, but there is a decrease in marijuana prices over time and increase in purity. So for all of these reasons, we would expect some dynamics and we are seeing dynamics in the effects here. Um, and then when we redo the analysis using the Calabay Santana estimator to sort of address some of these issues that have been brought up with the standard two-way fixed effects models, we find very, very similar results on the order of about three to five percentage point increase. Okay. I should also mention that we sort of cut our samples based on younger adults and older adults, and we found very similar absolute magnitude. So for both younger and older adults, we see about an increase in marijuana use on the order of about three to four percentage points. But because younger adults already had a high baseline prevalence of marijuana use, the absolute magnitude increase for young adults ends up being smaller in relative terms than it does for older adults. So the next question, right? So given that marijuana legalization has increased marijuana use, you know, is there any evidence that this increase in marijuana use among adults has spilled over into increased tobacco and cigarette use? And here the answer is no. Um, so whether we look at the entire sample, we look at young adults, we look at older adults, you know, we don't find any evidence of any increases in tobacco use and cigarette use. A couple of things just to note about these sort of event studies graphs, you know, first, before the policy adoption, the trends are very, very flat. You know, that is just a good indication about the quality of the natural experiment that with our controls, you know, we do have very reasonable parallel trends between the control group and the treatment group. And then there is no indication of any increases in tobacco and cigarette use after the policy adoption. And then when we redo this with the newer estimator, the Calabay Santana estimator, we again find very, very similar results. And in fact, if you look at it hard enough, you might actually even find some indications that tobacco use and cigarette use may be going down after marijuana legalization. So this decrease in tobacco and cigarette use actually materializes better once we account for the dynamics. And so if you just look at the average effect, you know, the coefficients are negative, not very precisely estimated, but you know, if you basically take those at face value, they suggest maybe about half a percentage point to a percentage point decrease in tobacco use, most of that driven by cigarette use. When we break up the dynamics a little bit better, you know, we actually find that over time, you know, when marijuana use tends to go up, we are finding a decrease in tobacco and cigarette use on the order of about one to one and a half percentage points. So no indication of any increases in tobacco use. On the contrary, we're actually finding some indication of a decrease in tobacco and cigarette use after marijuana legalization. Okay. Then we basically try to separate out what are the effects 
for legalization per se versus when retail access and dispensaries actually open up in the state. And here, as you would expect, when we look at the marijuana use effects, the first stage effects, we do find larger effects once consumers actually have retail access to the marijuana, when the retail dispensary started opening up in the state. Um, and then for tobacco use, we actually find that the effects on tobacco use, the negative decreases on tobacco use, they materialize more in the long term and specifically they materialize after consumers have retail access once the dispensaries are starting to open up in the state after legalization. Okay. Then we turn from the NISDA data um, to the BRFAS data. Again, this is the micro level data sets, big sample sizes, and we ask the same question with the BRFAS. The BRFAS does not have information on marijuana use. That was one of the advantages of the NISDA that we could observe both marijuana use and tobacco use in the same sample. In the BRFAS, we can only observe tobacco use, more specifically cigarette use for most of the sample period. But here again, event studies, we don't find any indication of any positive spillovers on tobacco use, very similar to what we found with the NISDA data. Okay. In the BRFIS, one of the small advantages, again, this advantage is much better when we turn to the PAD data, is that the BRFIS asked started asking questions on e-cigarette use starting in 2016. So we have data on e-cigarettes in the BRFIS for 2016, 2017, and 2018. For some reason, they don't ask questions on e-cigarettes in 2019. So we are able to look at at least e-cigarette use for those three years. And here we find some evidence of a decrease in e-cigarette use in the BRFIS after legalization. Again, the effects may be a little bit larger, stronger for young adults versus older adults, and maybe a little bit stronger after a couple of years after legalization. Um, we want to qualify these results with a grain of salt. I think we'll be able to do this a lot better when we get to the PAT data, just to keep in mind with the BRFIS, because we only have three years of e-cigarette data. You know, these effects are identified by a very few states. So we have very large standard errors. They're imprecise, large confidence intervals. But again, if the concern is that maybe marijuana legalization might be reducing cigarette use, but maybe increasing e-cigarette use, that is not showing up in the BRFIS. We're not finding, finding any indication of that. Okay. Heterogeneity, so this was one of the, at least on paper, one of the advantages of the BRFIS that we have this big eight, nine million sample size, so we could really cut our data in many, many ways. But given that the initial effects on tobacco use are small to begin with. Um, there's not much I can say about heterogeneity. It's very imprecise. Um, none of the effects across groups are statistically significant, meaning that we can't rule out the null that the effects are similar across different groups. But if we really just want to push at the point effects a little bit, um, just look at them prima facie. Um, what they suggest is that at least for everyday smoking, we're finding somewhat larger reductions for low educated respondents and then somewhat larger reduction for males. And then when we look at e-cigarette use, we're again finding somewhat larger reductions in e-cigarette use for low educated respondents, but across genders, we are finding very similar effects. Right. And then we turn to the CPS data, the tobacco use supplements. The main advantage of the CPS tobacco use supplements is that here we are able to observe all types of tobacco use, not just cigarettes, um, but also oral smokeless tobacco. And then in, for some of the years, we also have data on e-cigarettes. So here as well, similar to the BRFIS, similar to the NISDA, flat trends before the policy hits. Again, good evidence of the quality of the natural experiment. And there's no indication of any increases in tobacco use. Um, we actually find some decreases in tobacco use. Most of the decrease in tobacco use in the CPS TUS data is driven by a decrease in cigarette use. When we break this up into intensive versus extensive margins, we again don't find any evidence of increases. On the contrary, we find decreases. All right, so those were sort of the NISDA data and the pooled cross-sectional data. So now we go on to the longitudinal analysis with the PAD data. So these are much more um, sort of able to get us at, the, at, the, at, at, at some nuances with the research question. So again, one of the advantages of the PAD data is that this has information on marijuana use and tobacco use for the same sample. So first, let's look at marijuana use. You know, does legalization increase marijuana use in the PAD data? The answer is yes, again, by a large amount on the order 
order of about 10 to 20 percent relative to the baseline mean. So here we have, um, so this was one of the questions that C was asking, do you have information on how marijuana is consumed? So here we do find an increase in, mar in just any marijuana use as well as vaping marijuana as well. We have information here on blunts. Um, and I think this was something that um, Dan had alluded to as well. You know, what is the prevalence of blunt use in the data? So at least in the PAT data, um, past 30 day blunt use is on the order of about five to 6%. So we don't find any effects on blunt use. We are finding effects on marijuana use. We are finding effects on vaping marijuana, but we're not finding any significant effects on blunt use. Okay. So next question, right? So in the with the longitudinal data, again, these data are able to sort of now control for person level fixed effects. Do we find any effects on tobacco use in the PAT data in the positive direction, sort of consistent with some of the concerns that are being voiced? And the answer is no. In the PAT data as well, we don't find any significant or meaningful increases in tobacco use across any margin, cessation, initiation, intensive, extensive. Okay. Um, the PAT data allows us to sort of get at electronic cigarettes probably the best across all of these data sets. So when we look at electronic cigarettes in the PAT data, especially with the dynamics, we do find some decreases, some significant decreases in electronic cigarette use. Again, the decreases are on the order of about 10 to 15 percent relative to the baseline mean. So across all of these data sets, decreases in tobacco use, decreases in cigarette use. And with the PAT data, some indication is emerging that also there's maybe decreases in electronic cigarette use. These are the discrete time hazard models. Um, so these allow us to sort of get at these transitional probabilities. So here the question is, is marijuana legalization impacting, first of all, marijuana use among people who were previously not consuming marijuana? And the answer is yes. So we do find an increase in the probability that someone who was previously an abstainer is now initiating into marijuana use. And then the next question is, does marijuana legalization decrease the probability that a previous marijuana user is now going to quit? And the answer is yes, the coefficients are negative. These are about 10 to 15% decreases. They're imprecise, but there seems to be something going on on the cessation margin as well, that legalization is making it less likely that a marijuana consumer is going to quit marijuana. But again, when we look at any of the tobacco use behaviors, any of the tobacco use margins, we don't find any significant evidence of any increases in tobacco use. Okay. And then finally, you know, the big concern that is often raised when people talk about marijuana legalization as renormalizing tobacco use and smoking is they often point to the increase in dual use of both marijuana and tobacco. And so we, in the PAT data, we're able to look at whether marijuana legalization leads to an increase in dual use of marijuana and tobacco. And the answer is yes, we find significant evidence that it does increase dual use of marijuana and tobacco. So the question is why? Why is it doing this? You know, what are the mechanisms through which this dual use is going up? Because depending on what the mechanism is, this could be problematic. So one reason why you may see an increase in dual use of marijuana and tobacco is that legalization may be increasing marijuana use among people who were already tobacco users. So you already have people using tobacco. They were not previously using marijuana, but now legalization makes it more likely they will also start using marijuana. So that's a margin we can carve out in the path. And when we look at that margin with the discrete time hazard models, we do find a significant increase in marijuana use among people who were previously using tobacco and not using marijuana. The other mechanism that is possible is that it is also possible that legalization could be sort of impacting people who were previously not using any substance. So you have people who were not using marijuana, people who were not using tobacco, and maybe legalization makes it more likely that they will now transition into both um, use of marijuana and tobacco. When we look at that margin, that could be a very problematic margin because it could have very serious public health consequences. We don't find any effect there. So this is not coming from people going from abstaining from both substances to now using both substances. The increase in dual use is coming only from people who were previously using tobacco and now they've already started using marijuana. And then when we also look at dual use of marijuana use and vaping, we don't find any effects there. Okay. So let me just quickly conclude. Um, as I noted, there is this concern that um, 
marijuana legalization. It's a very plausible concern that it could renormalize smoking, it could renormalize tobacco use. Um, it could undermine a lot of the progress that we've achieved in the space. So we're presenting some of the first comprehensive evidence on this question, um, at least for adults. Um, we do find significant increases in marijuana use, but we don't find any evidence that this increase in marijuana use is translating into also increased use in tobacco um, and, and, and smoking and other forms of tobacco as well. You know, one big caveat, of course, here is that just given the nature of how recent these policies have been enacted, you know, the average effect that we're identifying is off of about maybe three to four years after the policy has been enacted. So it's very likely that these medium term effects may look very different once enough time has elapsed and these markets have matured. We do look at Colorado and Washington, some of the early adopting states in our in our sample. For these states, we have about seven years of post policy data. So when we extend our policy window for these states, we find very similar effects, at least in up to the medium term. But again, future future research should sort of you know make sure that the long term effects of these policies are not looking that different from what we have. And then finally, in terms of what the cost benefit calculus looks like. So our best estimates, at least our most consistent estimates, seem to suggest about a percentage point to a percentage and a half point decline in long-term smoking. If you combine that with what the healthcare costs of smoking have been found to be in the literature, this could lead to healthcare cost savings of about $10 billion a year. Again, this is just one component of that cost-benefit calculus. It needs to be balanced against all of these other sort of costs and benefits that I laid out before. But I guess the main point I want to end with is that, you know, when we're thinking about, you know, the rationale for policy efforts that we really should be considering not just the explicit costs and benefits through directly targeted outcomes, but we also need to be thinking about spillovers into these non-targeted outcomes. So let me end there and um, thank you. Thank you very much, Davo. That was fantastic. Again, let's turn to Dan to see whether he has any comments. Um, and then we'll turn to the questions. Uh, so I, I have a couple. Let me start um, by saying I, I found the path results really striking, particularly this finding of marijuana initiation among existing tobacco users. I think that helps rationalize like kind of everything that, that we're seeing. Um, and a couple of people in the um, chat were also wondering about that. Um, so I'll, I'll ask uh, questions on, on um, Rosalie Pacula's behalf. Um, are there limitations in the path in terms of the re like the coverage of um, states relative to um, the full uh, sample? And uh, could you tell us a little bit more about sort of coverage and path? I mean, that's a great question. I think I think I'm maybe Mike probably has a better um, um, sort of answer to that than I do. But as far as I know, I think the path is nationally representative. Um, all states are covered. Um, we have data from 2013 to 2019. And so that I think should allow us to well, I guess in the past, because the data starts in 2013, technically, I guess the early adopting states would not be identifying the effects if we the later adopting states. But in terms of coverage, I think the coverage is national. And Mike, Mike feel free to correct me if I'm wrong. Sounds like you got it. Okay, uh, great. So um, then maybe one more, uh, well, question for me at least. Um, so uh, th these results seem to me at least to be super um, reassuring for a particular public health concern. Um, but as I think about sort of going from the states that have already expanded recreational marijuana to um, uh, a broader set of states or possibly federal changes, there's like a couple of external validity questions that come up. Right. So one of them is, um, that we might expect different effects in states that have sort of looser uh, regulatory stances towards tobacco than states that have tighter regulatory stances. And in states where like there's lots more smoking or it's easier to smoke, lower taxes, you might expect very different spillovers. So I wonder how the existing recreational marijuana states compare to sort of the average state uh, on that dimension. Yeah, that's a great question, Dan. I, I think that's also something that has a lot of room for future research on this, right? In terms of, you know, one of the things that we've noticed is, you know, at least broadly, you know, states are getting more and more stricter on tobacco, but they're getting more and more liberalized on marijuana. So I think in terms of the states that we have, um, you know, the states that have sort of legalized marijuana, at least in our sample, something like, I think every state, except maybe for Montana, 
has cigarette taxes that are at the average or above average level. So you're absolutely right about that. For virtually all states in our sample, they have liberalized marijuana policies, but pretty restrictive, at least cigarette policies. I don't know how the e-cigarette taxes look like. And so, um, yeah, so one of the things that I think future research needs to be doing better, and, and there's a lot of room here, is to look at these policy interactions, right? You know, we typically look at each policy in isolation and then control for the other policies. But right, that could easily be, as you noted conceptually, right? These interactions between, you know, marijuana liberalization may have very different policy, may, may have very different effects in a state where cigarettes are very easy to access, very cheaper to access than in states which are not. And the states that have liberalized marijuana so far, you know, cigarettes are pretty expensive. And so, yeah, these effects could easily look very different in the other states if they started to liberalize. That's a very good point. So I think Mike has done a fantastic job cleaning all the questions. Uh, I do have a question though regarding the cost benefit analysis. So given your results and there are so many substances that are existing in the market. Uh, yeah, so there is also a question from the audience. So what would you recommend in terms of doing cost benefit analysis? Should we take account of all the substances and look at how they interact yeah, just uh, about your thoughts on this. Thank you. Yeah, that's that's a great, great question. Um, you know, um, one qualification, of course, um, you know, the numbers that I put up here, take this with a grain of salt. This is back of the envelope. Is it 10 billion? Is it 5 billion? Is it 15 billion? Sure, yes, maybe, right? Um, you know, and the healthcare costs that we are using here from the from, from Jinju study, this is the American Journal of Preventive Medicine, that was only healthcare costs, right? We're not taking into account things like secondhand smoke and so on. But you're absolutely right about that, right? I mean, you know, we're kind of lumping. So this was coming from smoking. But but yeah, I mean, now the, the tobacco landscape looks so different with so many different risk profiles across different tobacco products. And so if we are sort of looking at this more carefully, we definitely do want to sort of take account of exactly which products are increasing or decreasing in use and bring in what the costs are. Unfortunately, a lot of those costs are not have not yet been that well established in the data or in the literature. And so, but but yeah, conceptually, you're absolutely right about that, scene. And thank you to the audience member for bringing that up. We do want to do a much more careful job about the heterogeneity in the, in the, in the products and the risk profiles. Thank you. Uh, we are about time. So Mahmoud, can you take over? Um, thank you. Yeah, we, we are out of time. Thank you to our presenter, moderator, and discussant for wrapping up another great season of TOPS. We are currently accepting submissions for next season. If you are interested in presenting with TOPS, please submit your research presentation proposal on the TOPS website, tobaccopolicy.org by July 25th to be considered. Finally, thank you to the audience of 170 people for your participation. Have a TOPS Notch weekend.